Rice is the principal food for nearly half the world's population, but the way most of the world grows rice has become a major problem for our planet. The story of rice is way too big and complex for just one video. So for this episode of How Does It Grow, I'm turning the lens on one particular farmer who's doing it differently, whose small-scale method of farming rice offers a radical new perspective on growing grain in the USA. This is Nazirak Amen. Nazirak grew up in a Louisiana farming family, but he was always destined for medicine. His parents encouraged him to become a pharmacist. Instead, he became a licensed naturopathic doctor. For over two decades, he's worked as a physician in his adopted Maryland community, but the land has always drawn him back. I grew up in a community that was sustainable. But that connection to the land, to your food supply, that's sort of gone for a lot of people. Because at some point, it became cheaper to just go to the store and buy whatever you needed from the store than try to do it all on your own. And I think if you look at those communities, um, the level of chronic disease, since those folks stopped farming and stopped having anything to do with agriculture, their health collectively has gone downhill in relationship to how much they've gotten away from the land. Nazirak returned to farming as a way to nurture his community with fresh organic food, including his own family. Together, they grow 90% of the food they consume. Rice is the foundation for so much food in Louisiana. And as Nazirak told me, he used to eat rice for every meal except breakfast. But small scale regional rice production is almost non-existent in the United States. There are myriad reasons why, but one major challenge is affording all the expensive equipment. I mean, for us, some of the answers is if some of these larger scale equipment companies would actually scale down to the needs of the small farmer. For smaller combines, smaller scale grain processing equipment, all of those things are definitely part of creating uh, local food systems, local grain economies um, that would make communities much more sustainable. Nazirak had to source his small combine all the way from Japan, where rice growing is still largely community-based. Farmland itself also comes at a premium, particularly for African-American farmers, who have long faced a level of discrimination that's made owning land nearly impossible. But that needs a whole dedicated video. Nazirak rents his land wherever he can find it, in this case, in the middle of a suburban development. Rice needs to be both harvested and threshed, which is separating the grain heads from the straw. Those two things are usually done by one combine harvester. Then you need to de-hull the rice, meaning remove each grain from its papery sheath. You have to separate the grain from the chaff, that's what you call the hulls once they're detached. And then you have to clean the rice and dry it down to a shelf-stable percentage of moisture. But all that specialized equipment didn't stop Nazirak. He's part of a small band of rebel farmers trying to figure out in real time how to develop regional rice production in America. His way of life is rooted in chemical-free sustainable farming, the kind that supports the soil rather than depletes it. And so he knew there was one way he wasn't going to grow rice. He wasn't going to flood it in a paddy. <laughs> rice is a grass native to Asia but it's not an aquatic grass. The only naturally aquatic grass we eat is wild rice, which was a staple of many Native Americans. But it's something entirely different from domesticated rice. And it's domesticated rice we're talking about in this episode. 
The grains of rice that we cook and eat are actually the seeds of the rice plant. Rice plants have a central hollow stem called the primary tiller. From that tiller, a plant sprouts more and more secondary tillers, if given the right conditions. And from each of those tillers sprout flowers in clusters called panicles. The tiny flowers are pollinated by the wind, and each fertilized flower ultimately grows a seed. Rice first came to the Americas with the Spanish and Portuguese in the 16th century. South Carolina became the first commercial hub for rice in the U.S., thanks to the expertise of West African rice growers, who were specifically targeted by slave traders because they could sell a skilled rice farmer for a premium. These enslaved growers built a sophisticated system of canals and dikes in the coastal Carolina swamps. In the face of dire working conditions and the constant threat of contracting malaria, their agricultural triumphs supported the rise of a wealthy white aristocracy. For the record, the first state to lead the South out of the Union and into civil war was South Carolina, the rice kingdom that was built on the backs of nearly half a million slaves. Today, two and a half million acres of rice are grown in the U.S., with Arkansas, California, and Louisiana leading. But instead of relying on human labor to plant, weed, and harvest rice fields, we now depend largely on technology and chemicals. See, in America, we grow rice differently from most of the world. We do it big and mechanized. Typically, huge tracts of land are planted either by seed drill or by airplane, which drops immense amounts of rice seed across pre-flooded fields. This seed has been specifically bred to resist herbicides that are applied to fend off competing weeds. And controlling weeds is maybe the number one challenge with growing rice. It's the main reason why rice fields are flooded in the first place. So wait. Does that mean that rice can survive and even thrive without being flooded? Hold that thought. Hey, I'm glad you're here. I want to tell you about something that I know you'll love. And I know this because you're watching True Food TV. And that tells me you're someone who's curious about the world. The world of food, maybe the natural world too. You like a little bit of history, a little bit of science. You're my kind of person. And that's why you need to be on Curiosity Stream. It's been called Netflix for nerds, Hulu for history buffs. It is smart TV for your smart TV. Curiosity Stream has thousands of streamable documentary films and TV shows on topics that I know you'll care about. Like this documentary, Shade Grown Coffee, which makes me insanely jealous because I want to do a How Does It Grow on Coffee. Curiosity Stream has curated a treasure trove of documentary filmmaking you won't find anywhere else. Everything from ancient civilizations to space exploration. And if you sign up with my special discount code TRUEFOOD, you'll pay just $14.99 for the whole year. Seriously, a whole 12 months. So let's get back to the rice fields, but don't forget to hit Curiosity Stream with my TRUEFOOD offer code after this episode. Okay, let's go. Rice does not need to be flooded in order to grow. We flood rice fields because rice can tolerate flooding, while the weeds around it cannot. See, most plants don't like standing water. It suffocates their roots. And remember, the roots are like their mouths. Plants get most of their nutrients, including oxygen, from the soil. But rice is a unique food. It can survive despite these flooded conditions. That doesn't mean that rice likes growing that way, and I'll get to why that matters in a second. So most American rice growers flood their fields. Most of the world floods its rice fields. And that's a massive problem because flooded rice 
rice fields produce methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And the world's leading agricultural producer of methane after cows is rice farming. But it's not the rice itself that's the problem. It's the growing method. The water in a flooded paddy blocks oxygen from penetrating the soil. This creates the perfect conditions for anaerobic bacteria to flourish. As the bacteria chow down on the dying weeds and organic matter, they, well, pass gas, greenhouse gas, methane. And the longer the flooding lasts, the more bacteria builds up, the more methane is released. So is there another way to farm rice? Let's get back to Nazirak. So the farming that we do is regenerative farming, basically moving from a, a chemical farming into more of a biological farming, which means bringing the soil back to life and then having that life in the soil sustain uh, those plants and then sustain us in, in a lot healthier ways. This is upland or dryland rice farming. In other words, rice that's not flooded. It's watered, like most vegetable crops, by rain and irrigation. Nazirak starts his rice in seed trays and then transplants the baby plants into the field. So instead of needing 50 to 100 pounds of rice seed per acre, like the big farms that sow by airplane, he uses just one to three pounds per acre. He carefully transplants the seedlings nearly a foot apart from each other. That way, the plants aren't competing amongst themselves for nutrients, and they have lots of space to grow new tillers. 50. Yeah, so that's a really good tillering. That's beautiful. So that whole clump Yep, so this all started off with one plant, one stem. The more space you give plants, the more productive they can become. So for each plant, you want to find that space that gives it the maximum yield. Instead of flooding his fields, Nazirak saturates the soil with drip tape at key moments and uses a biodegradable mulch to suppress weeds. Unlike plastic, Nazirak's mulch will completely biodegrade by the end of the year. The rice plants grow through tiny holes in the mulch, but those tiny holes can also let in weeds. Generally, Nizirak and his family only have to weed the rice once a season. Then the only weeds they worry about are the ones growing in between the rows. Nizirak also has to battle the birds and a soil pathogen called blast. Each year, worldwide, the amount of rice lost to blast could feed something like 60 million people. And so Nazirak is constantly exploring varieties that are more resistant to blast, while finding the balance between growing a rice for good yields versus great flavor. He's grown premium Japanese sushi rice, red Filipino rice, and heirloom Russian rice. When the rice nears maturity, the birds can easily gobble up an entire season's worth of toil. Nizirak is often forced to harvest before all the rice grains are ready because, well, it's either harvest a field with a bit of green rice or harvest next to nothing. Nizirak typically grows six different varieties of rice on quarter acre plots and uses his small combine to harvest each variety.
After every harvest and every clean out, he has to make a two hour journey to a small processing facility set up by another rice farming friend. Nazirak sells his rice at local farmer's markets and on his website. I've put the link in the description below. Here's the hard truth we have to face. The future of farming will be shaped by the environmental catastrophes we're dealing with right now, like drought, flooding, extreme weather, and how those catastrophes impact our agriculture when most of the food we eat in the US comes from somewhere far away. The solution just may be the kind of regional farming revolution that farmers like Nazirak are leading, one small rice field at a time. We don't want people to cheer us on. We want people to join us, right? We want people to understand, like, if we don't get sustainable communities going, then there is no hope for us in the long run. More localized food systems is the answer to the future.